Today we are going to continue on our lecture uh, notes uh, for the MRCP uh, course review. And uh, this is lecture number 11 for the neurology part of the syllabus. Uh, last time we spoke about the extrapyramidal system along with meningitis and other features in neurology. We are going to finish the neurology part by this lecture. This is the last lecture of four series in neurology. We are going to discuss the cerebellum along with its ataxic disorders, how to differentiate it from other forms of ataxia. And additionally, we are going to discuss the brainstem and the famous brainstem crossed syndromes, which appears very commonly in the examination. Now, uh, this will be also along with the usual multiple choice question exam and answers to provide clear features on how to pick the keywords and correctly answer the, uh, to pass the examination. So the uh, slides today are basically uh, uh, for the cerebellum. The, the first question about the cerebellum before we start to discuss the slides is uh, usually comes in the exam either the part one or more often in the uh, paces. They ask you uh, what is the best investigation or what's the investigation of choice for evaluation of a patient with suspected cerebellar syndrome or cerebellar disease. So what is usually no, the CT, uh, the answer is not the CT. Why is that? Because the CT uh, uh, will not give it a very clear evaluation of the posterior fossa, right? So it's the MRI, exactly, thank you, excellent answer. So the MRI is the investigation of choice for patient suspected to have cerebellar disease. And this is the MRI, as you can see here, the cerebellum lies in the posterior fossa and it is separated from the cerebrum by the tentorium. So it's an infratentorial structure. And uh, we are going to discuss briefly the neuroanatomy of this part of the brain, which is called the cerebellum. And as we can see, it represents almost 10% of the total size of the brain. So it is a small structure lies in the back of the brain or beneath the brain and it has direct relation to this part which is called the brain stem. It's extremely interesting to know that despite the small size of the cerebellum but it contains neurons in fact has been reported to be even more than the entire nervous system neurons totally. So basically it has more than 50% of the total neurons of the nervous system crammed inside this small area called the cerebellum, which tells you that it has a lot of power for computation. Computation is the main function of the nervous system and the cerebellum is involved in this part by having large number of neurons uh, in its structure. So the cerebellum is attached to the brain stem by three pairs of tracts called the cerebellar peduncles. These are very famous peduncles and the reason for these peduncles is that the cerebellum not only needs to modulate the motor function or the information that is required by the brain as we're going to see very soon in this lecture but also it requires to obtain information from proprioceptors as well as position receptors and other parts of the body like stretch receptors and all this information has to come to the cerebellum so there's ingoing tracts and outgoing tracts to the cerebellum and this requires continuous communication with the different parts of the cerebellum of the nervous system and and this is happening through the cerebellar peduncles these are connections between the cerebellum with the other centers in the central nervous system 
This diagram here depicts the brain with its major parts. As you can see, this is the temporal lobe, this is the frontal lobe, this is the occipital lobe, and this is the parietal lobe. Now, below the occipital lobe lies the cerebellum, and it is in direct contact with the part that is below the cerebellar peduncles. This is called the brain stem. And this brain stem is basically composed of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And you can see that the peduncles which attach the cerebellum to the brain stem are basically three cerebellar peduncles, the superior peduncle, the middle peduncle, and the inferior peduncle. Now, further elaboration of these connections is depicted in this diagram where you can actually see this is the cerebellum. The cerebellum contains gray matter and white matter. And inside the white matter there are nuclei. We're going to discuss the nuclei that's present in the cerebellum. But also we need to see the anatomy of the cerebellum and it is attachment to the rest of the central nervous system. So the cerebellum basically is in close proximity of this space here. This space is called what? This is the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is this cavity that is attached to the aqueduct of Sylvius or mesenchymatic aqueduct and, and this further superiorly or rostrally it's attached to the third ventricle. So basically this is the fourth ventricle, part of the ventricular system of the brain where the CSF is flowing in this part. The roof of the fourth ventricle is composed by the cerebellum. So this is the relation of the cerebellum to the ventricular system. And this part here is the posterior part of the brain stem where the brain stem is classified into the midbrain. This is the pons, which is the bulging part, and this is the medulla. You can see that the peduncles are attachment of the cerebellum to the brain stem, and because the pons are in, in, in front, lies in front of the fourth ventricle and in front of the cerebellum, so these peduncles are related to the pons. We have the gray matter and we have the white matter, which actually a very characteristic feature of the cerebellum. It's also of note that you can see lots of folds. There are plenty of folds, particularly in this cortical part. And the, the reason for these folds to accommodate the large number of neurons. <coughs> So basically the cerebellum is composed of the cerebellar cortex, which is the outer gray matter extensively folded by transverse fissures to increase its surface area. The deep cerebellar nuclei are present in the white matter like the, they are actually three nuclei. One of them is written here, the fastigial nucleus. Do you remember or do you call the other names of the two nuclei? It's very simple to remember, it's basically the interposed nucleus and the dentate nucleus. So this is another diagram which shows the cerebellar cortex. You can see here lots of folds. You can see the folds here are resembling the gyri and sulci seen in the brain proper. But this is in the cerebellum, so the lots of folds to accommodate the large number of neurons. And the white matter is this area beneath the cortex which is basically contains the nuclei. This part here, you can see it, the dentate nucleus. We have dentate on this side and this side. And uh, you have the interposed nucleus here and the vestigial nucleus here, also bilateral nuclei. This is another diagram showing lots of nuclei. And these nuclei are extremely important in processing the information that comes to the cerebellum as well as coming out of the cerebellum. So in this regard, we have to anatomically know that the cerebellum is divided by two fissures into three prominent anatomical lobes.
we have two fissures. We have the primary fissure and the transverse fissure or the postulateral fissure. What are the names of the lobes? It's basically anterior lobe. We have the posterior lobe and we have the follicular nodular lobe. So we need to see this on the diagram. You can see that this is the anterior fissure and this basically uh, showed, shows here the anterior lobe. This part here is the anterior lobe. This is the posterior lobe which is this large area and it is separated by the primary fissure and this small part here is the flocculo nodular lobe. So as the name indicates, it has a flocculus and nodulus. And in the midline, there is a vermis. So the cerebellum resembles the cerebrum. The cerebellum has two hemispheres as well as a central line, but the vermis is an additional part of the cerebellum that is not present in the cerebrum. This diagram here shows you the different lobes of the cerebellum. We have here the worms in the center, which is basically, uh, uh, we are going to discuss the function of each of these structures, but this is the midline structure. The worms is in the midline, and this uh, part separates the left from the light, from the right hemispheres of the cerebellum. The anterior lobe is this part and this is the posterior lobe here in green and the gray part is the follicular nodular lobe which contains the folliculus. This is the part of the cerebellum which is called folliculus and this is the nodulus. So they are together contained as a follicular nodular lobe. And, and this is the horizontal fissure as well as the primary fissure that actually classifies into the lobes. So it's divided into three major functional divisions. So now we're going to discuss the function of the cerebellum. We discuss the anatomy, the structure of the cerebellum, and we're going to discuss the function. Why is that? Because the structure is mainly the subject that is discussing the composition of the cerebellum. But the function may not appear as simple as one may think. So therefore, the cerebellum is divided further into three major functional divisions. The vestibular cerebellum, which is the follicular nodular lobe, and from its name indicate vestibular, so it is basically concerned with the balance. While the spinal cerebellum, which is composed, composed mainly of the worms and the, and the paravermal zone, which is in the midline of the cerebellum. And this part, I like to think of it as the part concerned with the trunk, the movement of the trunk, the midline, and it's basically the midline, so trunk and gait. So this part is part responsible for the gait, and we will see as we proceed in this lecture that the disturbance of gait is related to this part of the cerebellum. The, cere the cerebral cerebellum is composed, of, composed mainly of the lateral zones of the cerebellar hemispheres and the lateral zones as it anatomically stays in the lateral parts of the cerebellum is mainly involved functionally with the movement of the limbs. So it, it mainly coordinates the movement of the upper and lower limbs. And this is basically the computational part of the function of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a very important organ that actually makes us smooth in our movements, in our visual movement, and in our balance additionally in our speech. So all these motor functions are produced from the motor cortex in the brain, but it is modulated through the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is regulating the fine movements involving the movement of 
different muscles in our body. Now this diagram here will show you that the cerebellum is an important structure that requires input and output information for final function which is the motor execution of the movements that requires a motor planning and further requires balance and eye movements and and this is basically done through different structural parts and these structural parts are concerned with certain function so the spinal cerebellum is here and this is the cerebral cerebellum and this is the vestibular cerebellum so as we mentioned the vestibular cerebellum is the follicular nodular lobe mainly which actually sent and received impulses from the vestibular nuclei which is concerned with balance and eye movement while the cerebral cerebellum is mainly concerned with the motor planning and it usually have information coming in and out to motor and premotor cortical areas and the spinal cerebellum which is in the middle part, the worms and the paravermal parts are involved with the motor execution to the medial descending systems as well as the lateral descending systems. And here you can see the input and output organization of the cerebellum which gives rise to extrinsic input, the mossy fibers and the climbing fibers. These fibers are either inhibitory or excitatory, but we like to think of it as modulator communication. First, we need to get the information, and this information is processed inside the cerebellum through different parts, and these parts are extremely interesting to know that vestigial, interposed, and dentate nuclei. These nuclei are represented in, as a center in the, in the white matter of the cerebellum and it gives rise to the organization. And further, to understand the functional part of the cerebellum, we need to look at the function as well as the structure of the cerebellum. So we have the spinal cerebellum. This part is the worms and the intermediate hemisphere. This is the worms here and these are the intermediate hemispheres. As you can see here, the spinal cerebellar part is responsible for the trunk mainly. So it controls the limbs and the trunk for the steadiness of the gait. So this is the stance or the steadiness of the gait. While the cerebral cerebellum, which is the lateral hemispheres, as you can see it here, is planning of movement like the, the first part is that you plan for movement you are trying to hold your cup or you're trying to raise your leg or trying to punch someone so you have to plan the movement and this part of the cerebellum is the part responsible for this the vestibular cerebellum is 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 the follicular nodular part and, and this is the follicular part, and this is the nodule here, very clearly shown, which controls the eye and head movement as well as balance. Now, this diagram is very famous because it's depicted in Gray's Anatomy, and you can see here the anatomical parts of the cerebellum, lots of neurons foldings into these folds. This is the gray matter. This is the white matter of the cerebellum. So what are these fibers? These are the fibers that is basically covering the peduncle. So these fibers are the middle peduncle and this is the superior peduncle and this is the inferior peduncle. So these are the peduncles that attach the cerebellum to the brain stem, mainly this part of the brain stem, which is the palms. You can see that there is a close proximity of one of the cranial nerves that we're going to discuss very soon. This is the trigeminal nerve, which is a very big nerve. And, and this nerve actually has representation 
for its large portion inside the brain stem along with the eighth nerve, the acoustic nerve and you can see here this is the olive part of the medulla and this is the pyramid part of the medulla at the ventral surface of the medulla. So this is the anatomy uh, as you have seen it in Gray's anatomy. So what are the, the functional parts <clears throat> that actually will explain this anatomy? We like to <clears throat> start by the tracts coming from the cortex. So we have the corticopontine fibers. These corticopontine fibers comes to the pons, as its name indicates, and at the pons they relay and then it goes from the pons through the pontine mossy fibers. From the pons it goes to the cerebellum we're carrying all the information that is planning certain movement from the cerebral cortex through the middle cerebellar peduncle. And inside the cerebellum, this information is processed through different parts of the cerebellum and the cerebellar nuclei, mainly the vestigial nucleus, the interpol nucleus, and the dentate nucleus then this information is computed and evaluated based on the information available to the cerebellum. So how the cerebellum gets its information? It gets its information from the climbing fibers and, and these fibers are coming from the inferior olive and <clears throat> mainly from the proprioceptive information from the spinal cerebellar tract the mossy fibers and the inferior cerebellar peduncle is the gate where this information comes to the cerebellum. So the first part of the movement is planning and this comes from the brain. The brain tells the cerebellum through these corticopontine fibers that I want to do this certain movement. The cerebellum starts to gather information regarding the position of the muscle in terms of how I'm going to do the movement. Is it suitable to do the movement as planned by the cerebral cortex or do I have to correct this movement according to the circumstances that we are in? Why is that? Because not every circumstances are the same. We don't walk on a stable grounds all the time. Sometimes this ground is tilted, sometimes this ground is narrow, sometimes this ground is wide, and sometimes there are obstacles around the ground. And for that reason, we need to understand the circumstances of our position, of our current position, before we execute the movements coming from the cerebral cortex and by gathering this information the cerebellum starts to fine-tune the orders and correct any errors available and then sends all this information back to the thalamus and the red nucleus and from there it goes back to the cortex. This diagram will show you further how this happens simply. Basically, the first thing is you need to get your orders from the brain. Very good. And this order of the brain goes to the muscle. But before going to execute this order, finally, there are adjustment. Uh, according to the cerebellum. So think of the cerebellum as the consultant. So there is a consultation here. The motor cortex is telling the cerebellum, I want to do this movement. Should I do it this way? Or what is your advice in carrying out this movement? And the cerebellum obtains further information from the muscle. Hello, hi, how are you? Okay, we'll stop here for a second. So as we were discussing, the function, the motor execution of any order comes from the motor cortex, 
and this motor cortex sends the impulses to the muscles, but before carrying out the order, it consults the cerebellum. So it goes, this information goes to the cerebellum through the intermediate zone of the cerebellum, and the cerebellum starts to obtain the situation. What is the situation? The cerebellum is saying that, hey, you want to do this movement? Okay, can you please tell me? You, the, the cerebellum starts to communicate with the muscle. Proper receptors, can you give me your status now? So the proper receptors send the status of the muscle, like we say that the muscle is stretched and we are on a solid ground, or we are on water, or we are in space. And all this information goes back to the cerebellum. The cerebellum gets this information, process the information, and look at the order coming from the motor cortex, starts to correct any error, and fine-tune this information, and send the final order back to the motor cortex through the cerebellum, and the motor cortex starts to execute the function as given by the cerebellum. So think of the cerebellum as the consultation, the consultant that gives you the final tuning of the movement. Yes, you have a crude movement, like for example, I want to move my arm, or I want to pick my cup, or I want to drink through movement of my arm, or I want to walk, or I want to run, or I want to jump. So all these movements are coming from the cortex, but to execute it in the proper way that it will not hurt your body and it will come smooth and accurate, it has to go through the cerebellum. And the cerebellum does this by getting information from the uh, proper receptors and uh, it, the communication comes in and out from the three different bedoncles. Okay. So here is basically the function that happens. Think of it as electrical circuit, right? So th this is how the uh, computation of the cerebellum happens. Initially, we have the afferent. The afferents are the information that comes to the cerebellum. from the afferents are coming from the associative cortex and, and you can remember here this is the premotor area uh, we have the area M1 and M2 and premotor area of the cortex these are usually the, the, the movement comes or the planning of the movement comes and then it goes through the pyramidal tracts the corticospinal tracts and also it goes to the pons and from there it reaches the cerebellum. At, at the cerebellum, the information is processed along with different other information coming from the spinal cord telling the cerebellum what is the status of the periphery. So we have orders coming from the center, the command control, the cortex. The cerebellum starts to obtain information from the periphery, the field, what is going on down there, and then process all this information compute the error and fine-tune the movement and then process this information through different nuclei, the dentate, the interpose, as well as the, uh, the vestigial nucleus. And then through, from there, it goes to the thalamus. And from the thalamus, it goes back to the cortex. So now the cortex get the information, fine-tuned, and, and this happened very fast. We don't actually feel it. It happens, but it's amazing the way things are happening at the cerebellar level. And of course, later on, this information goes back down to the peripheral muscle for the muscle to execute the order smoothly and nicely without any errors. So the function of the cerebellum basically is uh, balance. Without the cerebellum, this woman would not be able to walk on the rope. There is no way you can do this without a cerebellum. The same thing applies for the skating board. Not only the skating board, just simple walking will not be carried out properly and smoothly without the cerebellum. So I think the cerebellum is an extremely important structure in the brain and it is manifesting by its absence once you don't provide smooth outcome of your movements.
So the first function of the brain is equilibrium. Equilibrium is important. It happens without any notice. And of course, you can see that some structures or some humans are more uh, equilibrium friendly than others. And it requires the presence of intact cerebellum, but also requires learning. So there's a learning phase. So it is not basically just because you have a cerebellum, it works. No, you need to teach the cerebellum. And the way that we think of it is through the development of the cerebellum. So from the intrauterine life through the baby life, you remember the baby, they don't walk, they don't come out to life and walk. They have to learn how to walk. And then they have to learn how to run. And then they have, you have to teach them how to make their balance. So it takes time for all this information to be processed and learned. So there is a learning phase in the cerebellum. So the equilibrium of the cerebellar function is basically a regulation to adjust the tone and contractility of the axial and proximal limb muscles. And these are the muscles that are concerned with the equilibrium. This helps to maintain equilibrium during the change in head position, during exposure to acceleration or active movements of the body. And this cannot happen without input, telling the cerebellum about the information around our body as well as output. So the cerebellum is the final tuning part that corrects and regulates the error. It also functions to coordinate eye movements with head movements during exposure to acceleration. And I will tell you how this happened. For example, if you are trying to watch a bird flying without proper, functionally proper cerebellum, you will not be able to follow this. And the way you, you look at it, it happens automatically. You, know, you just look at something and you just trace it. And, and this movement of the eye, or to maintain clear vision, you need an intact cerebellum, and it is important for keeping equilibrium during head movement. Remember that despite you move your head, your vision is focused on the bird during its flight, or on the plane, or on a moving car, or an, on a moving object. So basically, this ability is done through the cerebellum, yes. So now we understand. And again, if you remember, we have the vestibular apparatus, which is basically uh, present in our ears. It's extremely important to the equilibrium part. So whenever we think of, the, of this, I, I don't know which disease you think of when you look at the labyrinth. Meniere's disease, right, correct. Meniere's disease is basically a disease very common because of the involvement here, along with acute labyrinthitis. You know, this is a viral illness that affects the labyrinth. And believe it or not, if you uh, developed an episode of acute labyrinthitis, it's common with upper respiratory tract infection and flu. And basically, you feel weird. You know, you feel like you are completely out of this world, like you are in outer space. You lose your equilibrium completely when you develop problems at this structure. So this is basically the vestibular nuclei. And you know, the vestibular nuclei are present basically in the follicular vestibular lobe. This is the follicular vestibular lobe that is uh, come bringing information from the vestibular or from the labyrinth for the equilibrium. So these are the afferent. So any problem in this part any disease in this part will definitely affect the equilibrium. It's not a cerebellar disease. This is a peripheral disease, but it manifests as a cerebellar disorder. And we will discuss how to differentiate between the disease that is affecting the labyrinth or the vestibular part, the peripheral vestibular part, and the central vestibular part or the command control of balance in the cerebellum.
And then the efferents coming out of the cerebellum after computing and processing the data regarding the equilibrium goes to the nuclei of the vestigial nucleus and intercerebellar nuclei. Basically, intercerebellar nuclei are mainly multiple, but we know the vestigial, the interposed, and the dentate nuclei. And then later on, after computation, this sends information to the muscles through the spinal cord and also sends information to the oculomotor nerve. Why is that? Because this is the control of the eye movement. The saccadic eye movement and the visual tracing eye movement is done through this electrical circuit. The second function is maintaining a posture. So a patient with cerebellar disease, they're not able to maintain a posture. Remember, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the posture of Parkinsonism. They have stooping posture. In patients with cerebellar disease, they don't have proper posture. Why is that? Because, as we can see here, the worms is the part of the cerebellum. This is the midline structure. The worms means a worm, basically, because it looks like a worm, right, in the middle of the cerebellum. And it involves the function, the position of the body. The vestibular spinal and reticular spinal tracts regulated the tone and contraction of the axial and proximal limb muscles. So this is basically the simple part of maintaining a posture. If you have the information from the limb muscles, you control it through the worms. The other function is coordination of voluntary movements. We mentioned that the initial phase of any voluntary movements comes from the motor cortex, from the cortical parts of the brain, but it is regulated and coordinating in the cerebellum. And the ability to proceed smoothly and precisely from one movement to the next in the proper succession is done through intact cerebellar function. Again, remember this diagram. I hope that you memorize it by now, you know. So this is the part of the brain, motor cortex, where the information comes from initially. And it tells the peripheral muscles the movement that is planned. But before executing this movement, it has to consult the cerebellum. So which part of the cerebellum? This fibers consult our plan of motor act, the actual performance. So it has to go through the cerebellum. Then corrective signals goes to the red nucleus after computation inside the cerebellum to carry out a smooth and fine movement. So any error in the planning of the movement is corrected here. So we have seen the structure of the cerebellum and we touched base on the function of the cerebellum. We mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, despite the smaller size of the cerebellum that lies in the posterior inferior tentorial posterior fossa of the brain uh, or the cerebrum or the skull, this small structure contains more neurons than any part of the central nervous system. And that means it requires a lot of neurons for computation. And this computation is manifesting once this cerebellum gets disordered or diseased or not able to carry out the function. We will find out the reason for cerebellar disorder, the causes that affects the structure of the cerebellum which manifest as abnormal function. So the basic function of the cerebellum is fine tuning of movements. And this is evident when you are trying to point by your finger to certain point. So normally you should go direct from A to B. In patient with cerebellar disorder, you get this hesitancy. And this hesitancy is due to dyssynergia and also is due to intention tremors at the 
end phase of movement. So at the beginning, the patient is trying with the cerebellar disease is trying to reach that point, but there is no cerebellar function to fine tune the movement. So what will happen? You will find this irregularity. This abnormality in movement is called ataxia. Additionally, you don't touch the exact point. You actually pass the point. So you have hypometria or in certain phases hypermetria or past pointing. So you don't reach the exact point, but you go further. This is again a cerebellar dysfunction. In addition, there is a delay in the response. And, and this also manifestation of the, the important part is the incoordination of rapid alternating movement. And, and you all know from the medical school, the term for that is called this diadocokinesis or this diadocokinesia. So instead of doing it normally, alternate movement smoothly, you have abnormality in doing the movement. So these are the cerebellar signs. The commonest one which we see in the clinical practice and it comes very common in the exam is the ataxia. So that's why we're going to discuss ataxia in detail and we'll try to differentiate between different forms of ataxia. Ataxia simply is a Greek term. You know that medicine, most of the Latin words are coming from the Greek terms and, and taxi in Greek means order. So ataxia means lack of order. And that means that the lack of order of fine tuning and executing certain movement. And, and that's usually a cerebellar dysfunction. But it also can occur due to other parts outside the cerebellum. Because we said the cerebellum without the input and output information, it will not be able to carry the function. So if the, these parts are also diseased, then ataxia will take place. However, we need to understand ataxia related to cerebellar disease. So it denotes a syndrome of imbalance and incoordination involving gait, limbs, and speech, and usually results from the disorder of cerebellum or its connections. It's characterized by dyssynergia, dysmetria, dysdadicokinesia. Dyssynergia means that there's syn synergy, there's harmony between the movements of different muscles. So if the muscle is contracting, the other muscle has to relax so the movement will come smooth. But the lack of synergy between different orders will come as hesitant or ataxia or lack of order. Dysmetria means that you don't reach your target. In reaching the target, first you have to calculate how much force and, and what is the direction of this force? What is the amplitude of the force? What's the rate of this force? Should I do this force once or twice or three times to reach that target? And because of lack of cerebellar computation, you develop or patient usually develop dysmetria, either hypometria or hypermetria, not reaching the exact point. And we discussed that this diadocokinesia, which is basically lack of smoothness of doing alternate movements. It's a disorder of rate, range, direction, and force of movement, as we mentioned. The follicular nodular lobe disorders. Do you remember what this lobe is? Okay, it's actually the lower part of the cerebellum, and it manifests by lack of balance, right? So it is concerned with balance. And uh, the first manifestation is swaying during standing. So they don't stand still as one unit. They just keep swaying from one side to another, like a pendulum. And this is because of lack of function of the follicular nodular lobe. So the, there is no stance. They don't stand still. And, and that's the problem. So they have swaying during standing with tendency to fall down. And we know that if this happens, the lesion would be pointed towards the follicular nodular lobe. There's also unsteady 
old staggering gait, right? And, and the prototype of unsteady or staggering gait, as we've seen it in real life and in movies as well, is a person who is drunk, right? Someone who has been drinking, boozing, drinking lots of alcohol, and basically at the end of the day, they are not able to walk properly. They stagger, they, they have reeling, they go from side to side, and, and that's how we know that these people were drinking. So it's called drunken gait or staggering gait. Well, believe it or not, it's a cerebellar function, which tells you that alcohol is one of the important issues that it disturbs the cerebellar function. So when you remember in the exam, if you are asked about the causes of cerebellar dysfunction, Recall that alcohol, along with drugs and toxins and, and other things, mainly demyelinating disorders and autoimmune disorders, that actually affects the cerebellar function. But the way to remember it is by the drunken gait or unsteady or staggering gait. So it's wide-based in order to provide better equilibrium during walking. The vermal disorder, remember the verms is the worm in the center of the cerebellum and it is involved or manifested basically by inability to maintain the upright standing posture. So the posture of stance is a manifestation or a function of the verms. And when the verms is affected, there is inability to maintain this upright standing due to failure to adjust the tone and contractility of anti-gravity muscles. Now, in, in, in upper motor neuron lesions or disease, there is spasticity, right? In extrabramidal disease, there is rigidity. But in patient with cerebellar disease, what do you think the tone? There is hypotonia. There is hypotonia, and the reason for that is that because there is failure to adjust the tone. So this is the explanation. The cerebellar syndrome is basically manifested through three different parts. The first part is the hypotonia, the second part is the asthenia, and the third part is the ataxia. So we mentioned the meaning of ataxia is lack of order. The hypotonia is reduced tone, but what is this word, asthenia? It's weakness, fatigue, fatigue. So the, the, the reason why I'm focusing on this, because remember, in cerebellar disease, the power is intact. You don't have weakness. So asthenia here is not a true weakness, it's rather a fatigue. But the muscle itself is not weak. The movement, if, if you ask these patients to hold your fingers, they will have full power. If they have weakness, then it is not explained by cerebellar disease. There must be a lesion somewhere else to explain it, either at the level of the muscle or at the level of the pyramids or whatever, right? So it's either upper or, more, or lower motor neuron lesion. But in, in the asthenia is, is, is basically the feeling of weakness. It's mainly fatigue in cerebellar disease. Dysmetria is basically explained by errors in the range and direction of the movement. The moving limb more often overshoots the intended point and it's either hypermetria, past pointing, but sometimes the limb undershoots the intended point which is hypometria. So uh, these are basically dysmetria. And the way you do this in clinical examination is you ask the patient to touch your finger, right? So you actually hold your finger or hold a pencil before the eyes of the patient. You know, you, you, you stay away from the patient and you ask them to touch with their finger and you start to move your finger or you move the object away and ask the patient to follow and touch. And sometimes we ask the patient to do this and touch their nose so that we are trying to trick the cerebellum that different information are coming 
or testing basically the dysmetria. Okay? The intention tremors are kinetic tremors. Remember, if you recall from the previous lecture, we spoke about the tremors of Parkinsonism. Remember, Parkinson's tremors are not intention. They are tremors at rest. However, in patients with cerebellar disease, do they have tremor at rest? No. At rest, there is no tremors. But when they start to initiate the movement, in fact, not at the beginning of the movement, at the end phase of the movement, that's when you find the intention or the kinetic tremor. Kinetic means movement. So they appear when the patient performs a voluntary motor act, not seen when the muscles are at rest, which differentiates these tremors from the tremors of Parkinson's disease. Nystagmus. What is nystagmus? It's basically tremor of the eyeballs as a result of dysmetria of the saccadic movements of the eyes. So instead of smooth eyeball movements, which, which nerve uh, controls the eyeball movement? Oculomotor nerve, which is the third. Trochlear nerve, which is the fourth. Abducen nerve, which is the sixth. So we have three major cranial nerves that controls the extraocular muscles. And basically, we know that nystagmus is present when there is tremor of the eyeballs as a result of lack of proper control of cerebellar function. So that, does any other disease causes nystagmus? Yes. In fact, not only a disease, but just severe errors of refraction, like severe myopia, can give rise to nystagmus. You know? So nystagmus, despite the fact that we think of it as a tremor of the eyeball due to cerebellar disease, but again, it happens in several other disorders. Because it involves a lot of function to cause this nystagmus, right? So the next is dysarthria. So what is this arthria? It's basically abnormalities in speech. Despite the fact that we speak simply and we don't actually think of the spoken words while we're speaking, but it requires a lot of computation to bring out a very smooth speech. And again, the speech requires a learning phase. You know, Again, think of it as when the babies are born with their cerebellum, they don't talk. They need someone to teach them how to talk. And the initial phase of speaking resembles cerebellar disorder because the, the way they actually speak the words is interrupted. And, and that's basically the scanning speech. While the other part of the described in cerebellar disease is called staccato speech is actually explosive or burst. And again, we see this when someone is trying to actually speak an obscure foreign language for the first time. So we have two different abnormalities in speech. We have the scanning speech. The speech is not smooth, it's interrupted. Scanning. And what is staccato speech? Staccato speech is explosive speech. And that's why you need to ask your patient to repeat certain phrases or certain words to see how the speech sounds like. Like you can ask him to say British Constitution. So instead of saying West Register Street or British Constitution smoothly, they say British Constitution. So this is a scanning. Or sometimes they have burst, you know, like British Constitution. So basically, the abnormality is evident when you test the speech. But you have to tell them certain words in their own spoken language. You don't tell them foreign language. Otherwise, you know, everybody would not be able to do it, right? So that's basically this arthria. It's a manifestation of cerebellar disease. So does this arthria 
only takes place in cerebral disease? No, there are several other reasons for this artery. But characteristically, scanning or staccato speech is seen in patient with this artery. And again, if you recall, if someone has been doing a lot of drinking, again, alcohol actually, you know, present with cerebral dysfunction in speech, they have this artery. So they speak in a very, and you've seen it in the movies, you know, when they show someone who's drunk, their, their spoke, spoken language is different. Okay. The decomposition of words is due to failure to adjust the precise timing of contraction of different muscles of speech. So that's the reason, you know, to, to, to be able to provide a normal, smooth, spoken words, you need to contain these words or to provide information or to execute movements of certain muscles, the muscles of the tongue, the lips, the muscles of the pharynx, the throat, and all the muscles attached to the larynx. Any abnormality in this part will present as death artery or abnormalities in spoken words. The unstitting gait is a hallmark feature of the cerebellar syndrome. The gait is unsteady and broad-based due to dysmetria and kinetic tremors of the lower limbs. So we have here two different types of gait. Now this patient is standing without swaying, right? Standing in the midline, very normal posture. But look at this patient here. Swaying. So this is abnormal posture. This is normal posture. Now this patient is trying to move, but yeah, very good. So this is basically high stabish or stamping gait. It means that this patient has problems calculating the amount of information needed to raise their foot up. It doesn't look like cerebellar disease, right? Because that's not a function of cerebellar disease. Cerebellar disease is basically does not have this movement. And again, this patient is almost trying to fall. So these features here are the sensory part of, of gait abnormalities. So patient with sensory ataxia or due to peripheral neuropathy or posterior colon problems. We've seen it in, in patient with diabetes or patient who have neuropathy for any reason. They do these kind of, of posture and gait. While this patient is classical of cerebellum, so there's lack of balance and there's swaying in the posture, again, the gait is completely staggering. Remember, we don't, uh, initially we ask them to walk normally, but then we have to also force them to show us the signs because some of the signs are subtle. They don't show grossly. So we ask them to do certain gates. Do you know what kind of gates we ask them in the examination? We ask them to do tandem gates, which is basically putting the front part of the toes to the heel of the other foot. So it is called tandem gait. Sometimes we ask them to walk onto their heels and sometimes we ask them to walk on tips of the toes and, and, and that's different types of gait just to show different signs in different parts of disorders in the central nervous system. So if, if there are different parts of ataxia, as we have seen in the previous photo, then we have to differentiate how to differentiate sensory and cerebellar ataxia. Sensory ataxia is due to severe sensory neuropathy, gangliopathy, or lesions of the posterior column of the spinal cord. For example, patients who have autoimmune disorders like Sjogren's syndrome, or patients who have been exposed to toxins like cisplatin, or patients who developed the syndromes due to paraneoplastic disorders, or patients with infections like syphilis, tertiary syphilis, or tabus dorsalis. So these are basically patients that, that develop the abnormality of, of the posterior colon. And the hallmark examination of the posterior colon is a simple test, which is called the Romberg's test. Do you recall what's Romberg's test? Romberg's test is to ask the patient 
to stand with their feet forced together. So that they should stand like uh, in the previous picture like this. They stand with their feet forced together and then you ask them to close their eyes. Now a normal person should be able to keep their posture but a person with positive Romberg sign or Romberg's test, they fall. They either fall front, back, left or right. And this is a whole bar feature of a posterior column dysfunction. So how to differentiate between cerebellar ataxia and sensory ataxia? We have the speech. In patients with cerebellar ataxia, you have abnormal speech, right? But in patients with sensory ataxia, do they have any problem with their speech? No. The speech is normal because they don't have any problem there. All right, so the nystagmus, again, so this is the, uh, this arteria of the cerebellum, and this is the nystagmus of the cerebellum. Patient with sensory ataxia, they don't have it. So look at the eyes and look at their speech. Examine the speech and examine the eyes and differentiate between the sensory ataxia and cerebellar ataxia. Romberg's test, is it present or absent in patient with cerebellar disease? It's absent, so it's a negative test in patient with uh, cerebellar ataxia. And moreover, if you examine the sensory system, the sensory system is intact. So the sensory system and the power in patient with cerebellar disease is intact. Remember that. The power is normal. If the power is abnormal, you need to find out an explanation for that. If the sensory system is abnormal, you need to find explanation of that. And of course, in these patients with sensory ataxia, you may have sensory loss, like patient with diabetes or, or whatever, and the Romberg test will be positive. The reflexes in cerebellar disease or cerebellar ataxia are characteristically normal, or they may show pendular reflexes. So it is not increased or decreased, it's pendular. It just keep pendling. It does not actually stop after movement. And, and that's again is shown in one of the features of cerebellar disease, a phenomenon called rebound. You know, so the check means that you have to check or stop movement. It doesn't happen when the cerebellum is abnormal. So therefore the reflexes are pendular, where in fact in patient with sensory ataxia or sensory abnormality or abnormality of the sensory system, they may have hyporeflexia or areflexia altogether, like in patient with guillain barre syndrome. This is a neuropathy. Patient with diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, right? They may have areflexia or hyporeflexia. Now the gait in cerebellar ataxia is reeling. A reeling means what? Swaying from side to side. So when they move, <coughs> it's a drunken gait. But in, in patients with sensory ataxia, like you mentioned, it's a stamping gait. So it's a high stepage. They, they raise their legs <coughs> because they don't feel the ground. So they raise their legs and it, it looks like a stamping gait. The way to differentiate vestibular from cerebellar ataxia. So vestibular, the problem where? in the vestibular operates in the ear, right? While cerebellar, the problem in the cerebellum. How to differentiate? Vestibular ataxia is due to lesions of vestibular pathway resulting in impairment and imbalance of vestibular inputs, like vestibular neuritis, streptomycin toxicity, Meniere disease, whatever, right? So how to differentiate? Let's think of it again. In cerebellar ataxia, the sense of imbalance while in vestibular disorder, there is vertigo and associated tinnitus and hearing loss. So this points us towards an ear problem, a vestibular problem. In cerebellar ataxia, there is pass pointing in ipsilateral limb, but in vestibular disorders, usually it's in both limbs. The speech is affected in cerebellar ataxia, but why the speech would be affected in vestibular? does not. So the speech is normal. Again, certain other features in cerebellar ataxia are not present in vestibular. Like what? Like the intention tremors. They don't have intention tremors. Patient. They, they are mainly having vestibular equilibrium problems. So there's no tremors. They don't have dysdadicokinesia. 
they don't have rebound phenomena, and that means that the reflexes are normal here, right? And they don't have hypotonia, and they don't have pendular reflexes. Okay? All right. Now, the third differentiation is between the cerebellar and the frontal lobe. Some of the frontal lobe syndromes are very common among the elderly, like patients with dementia or small vessel disease affecting the frontal lobe. They may sound like cerebellar syndrome, right? They may have ataxia, frontal lobe ataxia. So we need to differentiate, and this comes in the exam as well, because these patients are present in the hospital where you go for your exam. So they ask you how to differentiate. And most of the time we see it in the MCQ or multiple choice question examination. The way to differentiate is basically simple. So there is a wide-based support in cerebellar disease and wide-based in frontal lobe disease. So we cannot differentiate between the base. The velocity is variable in cerebellar disease. In patients with frontal lobe, they are very slow. The steps are irregular, but in frontal disease, it's shuffling like patient with Parkinsonism, right? Remember that. And the heel to shin is abnormal in patient with cerebellar, while the heel to shin is normal in patient with frontal lobe. Do you know how to do the heel to shin test? You ask the patient to raise their legs, put the heel on top of the knee, and then bring it down on the chin all the way down to the foot. And you ask them to repeat. But first you have to teach them how to do it and then ask them to repeat. In patients with cerebellar disease, they have irregularities as usual. So they have ataxia in performing such movements. And this is not present in patients with frontal lobe disorders. There is also the initiation of movement is hesitant in frontal lobes. Like, for example, you know, the, the patient with frontal lobes, they have, they, they, they're very slow. They don't move. You know, you, you put them on a chair, they stay there in the chair the whole day without movement. They don't have the intention to initiate movement. Right? So when we are talking about initiation of movement, we are not talking about the, mo the actual movement itself. We are talking about the initiation of movement, you know. Like, you know, they, they stay in bed. They don't move. They're basically not lazy, but they don't have the ability to initiate their movement. And, and this also is shown in when they are turning. They are hesitant to turn. And they, they, they do it in multi-steps. They don't just turn immediately to one side or another. They take time to turn. So it's, they do it in phases, right? So this is the frontal lobes, where in fact in patients with cerebellar disorders, they have unsteadiness when they start turning, but the movements will, it will be in one step. Postural instability is manifesting more evidently in patients with frontal lobe disease compared to patients with cerebellar disease. And of course, the falls is a late event when the disease is is, is grossly evident in patients with cerebellar disease, while in patients with frontal lobes, they fall frequently because they're very fragile and, and, and old. Important point in the history to differentiate, the age at onset. So the younger age group may suggest hereditary attacks, right? Compared to the age groups, uh, the older age groups for cerebellar disease. And remember, the cerebellar disease is the mode of onset is, is usually insidious. Why is that? Because it takes time for the toxins to affect this large number of neurons present in the cerebellum. And most of the time, it is due to toxic exposure, alcohol, drugs, toxins, demyelination in general. Precipitating factors, again, can differentiate or tell you what is the form of the ataxia. Uh, like, for example, a patient who's been drinking or exposed to certain drugs or a patient who had malignancy and then they come with paraneoplastic disorders versus patients who had stroke or patients who had autoimmune disorders. Diabetic patient, for instance, they may present with ataxia, but it is not cerebellar. It is sensory type of ataxia. Uh, 
So therefore, the rate of progression is important. And the symptoms of raised intracranial pressure may suggest the presence of space-occupying lesions. So again, this part is important in the history. The presence of systemic symptoms may also point out towards the underlying diagnosis and the drug history and toxin exposure along with the family history for genetically acquired diseases, right? There are lots of ataxia that is genetically inherited and we may touch base on some of these ataxias. The examination is important to differentiate as well and basically in, in examination you look for neck tilt and tight tubation which is present in frontal lobe or multi impact dementia they, they have uh, basically a tight tubation nystagmus and other ocular movement uh, abnormalities are important to differentiate the, the different parts dysarthria dysarthria is not necessarily presenting as scanning speech or staccato speech. This art there could be in articulation or in the spoken words itself or in the form of executing the speech itself, which makes a whole lot of difference towards where is the lesion. The intention tremor is also an important issue. We mentioned that if it is intention, then it is likely to be cerebellar, where if it is at rest, it is unlikely to be cerebellar. The hypotonium with normal power is towards cerebellar disease. The past pointing rebound phenomena, macrographia. Now this is the opposite of micrographia that we discussed in patients with Parkinsonism. So basal ganglia disorder will give you small handwriting, while patients with cerebellar disorder they give you large handwriting. So if if you're Handwriting start to getting bigger. Think of a cerebellar problem, where if your handwriting is getting smaller, think of a Parkinsonian problem, right? And uh, so far, my handwriting is the same. Uh, I'm watching carefully my handwritings to be able <laughs> to diagnose the disease. The stance is, is, is very important. We have seen that, you know, standing, continue. Just ask the patient to stand and if they hold their position steady or they are swaying. The ataxic gait, we mentioned that, and the pendular reflexes, we mentioned that as well. The hereditary ataxia are one of, of terrible diseases that we have to study, and I don't know why they like it in the exam. There are actually multiple hereditary ataxia, but it pops up in the exam, and we have to study it. It is not a very good topic, but we'll try to make it simple, okay? We will discuss it together. <clears throat> These are insidious onset, symmetrical and progressive forms of ataxia. Because once it starts to affect the patient, it progresses. And there's nothing we can do about it. Except counseling of the parents who tell them, don't bring any further children because they may have the disease. So stop getting pregnant. Or, 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 or don't continue in your marriage, you know, just get divorced or, or go and find another wife or another husband. Well, we don't say it in this way, but the reason I'm putting it in this way, the ugly way, is because we don't have a treatment or cure for these people. We, and being a physician, your role is to help. Your role is not to tell the patient your, the diagnosis. The, 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 this is the function of the physician, is to reach the diagnosis. But your role, your function towards the patient is to help them to manage their disease. There's very little we can do for these insidious progressive disorders of hereditary ataxia. The age at onset, early onset ataxia, age at onset below 25 years, is more likely to be consistent with autosomal recessive. And again, this comes in the exam. Which one is the autosomal recessive and which ones are the autosomal dominant? So general, you know, it is not the rule, but in general, if the age at onset is below 25 years, it's autosomal recessive. And, and, and the prototype of autosomal recessive is the Frederick ataxia, right? While the late onset ataxia, age at onset over 25 years, it's usually for those ataxia with dominant autosomal dominant inheritance. The family history, 
what do we ask a patient with inherited disease in the family? And I think this is not only for the hereditary text, for any inherited disease. You think of direct uh, questioning of the patient and relatives. Anyone else in the family is affected? We need to know to establish a pattern of inheritance, right? And then history of consanguinity. History of consanguinity is common in the Arab world. Because, you know, usually cousins marry each other. And again, it's common in Egypt as well. The, the families, they like to marry from each other. Hopefully, with the prevalence of the internet now, people can meet strangers and they can marry different people than, than their own relatives, right? Because we know that consanguinity it means that it will keep the disease running in these families. And the best example throughout humanity for showing consanguinity is shown in the Jews. The Jewish population usually, because they think that they are better than the rest of the world, they have to marry from each other. So they keep diseases within the same family. And, and that's why consanguinity may subject to the inheritance of the same disease. Pedigree charting to find out about the disease and also the negative family history does not exclude the diagnosis. You know, I remember one of my patients who had hereditary attacks here yeah? uh, and I, I recall this very carefully because I remember that there was no family history at all and that means and we were questioning the diagnosis because we said, how could this be a hereditary ataxia where there was no family history, but it happens. And in general, this can be explained by several reasons. Number one, maybe no one in the family was diagnosed, you know. Maybe they didn't go to a doctor or maybe they died young and, and no one have seen the disease. Additionally, the patient could be adopted, right? So these are not their real parents. So for that reason, if you have absent or negative family history, it does not rule out the inheritance. Okay, so the autosomal recessive ataxia are basically Friedreich ataxia comes in the exam. Very good. Have you seen patients with Friedreich ataxia in your practice? In medical school. Yes, it comes in the school and in the exam, but you don't see it in clinical practice. Yeah, usually they are very chronic and uh, they come in the exam, but uh, it's usually autosomal recessive. It's a progressive form of ataxia. And uh, the, the explanation or the mutation, it's a genetic disorder, expansion of the GAA triplet repeats leads to a defective protein fratexin. We'll discuss this in very simple, but just remember that this is a genetic disorder, Friedreich-Ataxia, and it, the mode of inheritance is autosomal recessive. And it is basically, this is the chromosomal abnormality. It is 9Q13Q21-1. The other is the vitamin E deficiency. It's also another chronic form of ataxia, and it is autosomal recessive. Clinical features of Frederick ataxia, because it comes very common in the exam, so I said I'll put one or two slides just to make sure that we touch base with it. It's an autosomal recessive inheritance. The onset before 25 years. It's progressive limp and gait ataxia. And it has an absent deep tender reflexes in the legs. There is electrophysiological evidence of axonal sensory neuropathy. There is dysarthria and there is areflexia in all four limbs. The distal loss of position and vibration sense. There's also extensive plantar responses pyramidal weakness of the legs. Well, this is the reason they come in the exam. Why is that? Because you can see there is weakness, pyramidal. So this is upper motor. 
neuronation, right? But there is also what? Aeroflexia. So this is lower motor neuron lesion. And not only that, but be, there is absent deep tender reflexes in the legs with upgoing plantar response, which is extremely difficult to explain. You expect the reflexes are lost. This is lower motor neuron lesion, so the plantar should go down. But yet the plantar goes up. Why? Because there is pyramidal. So a combination of pyramidal signs and lower motor neuron signs are present in Frederick ataxia. And for that reason it comes in the exam. Examine this patient reflexes. So you, you actually don't elicit any reflexes. Then they ask you examine the plantar response. So you make the plantar response and it's upgoing. You're stuck. He cannot explain it unless the patient has Friedrich ataxia, right? So it develops within five years of onset of disease. It's a progressive autosomal recessive inherited disease. The FXN gene codes for the frataxine, contains amplified inotropic chronic GAA repeats that reduce transcription. So it's a genetic problem, right? Just recall that it's a, an electronic GAA repeat that reduced transcription. So it's at the level of the genes itself. And fratexin is involved in synthesis of heme and iron sulfate complexes, which means that there will be iron deposition, right? So these patients may develop under, and if there is a deposition in the organs, that means that certain organs will show abnormalities. So what are the organs abnormal? Diabetes, because of the pancreas. They may develop diabetes. What else? The heart. They may develop cardiomyopathy. So these are very common features, and we'll see this in the next slide. The disruption results in increased mitochondrial iron and free radicals induced cell damage. So increase mitochondrial iron and increase in the free radical lead to cell damage. I'm sorry? Okay, that's why I put this slide for discussion. The fratexine is involved in the synthesis of heme and iron sulfate complexes, right? So it's processing of the iron itself. Now this fratexine is disturbed. Just think of it as there is abnormality that the iron is not being processed. So the end result, what will happen? The mitochondrial iron starts to increase. So there will be deposition of mitochondrial. The iron should not be there. It should be processed to produce heme, basically. So instead of producing heme, it goes and deposited in the mitochondria. And this leads to what? To cell death, or cell damage, not death. And for that reason, we will have this clinical manifestation. So because of this, we will have muscle weakness in the arms and the legs, because of the abnormalities we mentioned in the gene. We will have loss of coordination, because of cerebellar disease, vision impairment, hearing impairment, slurred speech, we have also scoliosis, the bo even the bones are affected. We have high plantar arches, which is present as pes cavus. You know, when you are asked to do the plantar response, you look at the foot and you find this harsh, high arch foot, which is pes cavus deformity of the foot. And these patients may have diabetes. It affects around 20% of these patients if they live to show diabetes. And they may have heart disorders like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and later on they develop dilated cardiomyopathy along with atrial fibrillation. So this is the clinical manifestation of Frederick ataxia. Very common exam question either on part one, part two or the paces. Uh, my, I, I remember myself I had a patient with Frederick ataxia. In the, it was not paces uh, during my days it was long case and short cases. 
It was the last exam for long and short cases, and after which they changed to the paces, right? So basically, it was uh, Frederick ataxia, and, and it was very classical. I, I, I picked up the diagnosis, and I start to show the examiners that I know all the features of the disease. The other form of hereditary ataxia is, is common in the exam as well. It's called CMT or chart Mary tooth ataxia. Okay, this is Dr. Martin Chart. Uh, Jean Martin Charcot and his student Pierre Mary and Howard Tooth from England, they describe the disease. And remember that these diseases described over 200 years ago. So neurology is fairly new. You know, before this, they didn't know. And how did they find out about this? They actually studied the disease during life. They didn't have anything to offer. Then after the patient dies, they start to dissect and find out the abnormalities, right? And they describe the disease. But these patients, they have very characteristic legs. They have thin legs. And not only thin, but the, it is described in books as inverted champagne bottle. So they have very thin part while the calves are thick, right? So this is the prevalence as high as 1 in 2,500. It's autosomal dominant inheritance. So remember, Frederick ataxia is recessive. Charcot Mary tooth is dominant. Males are more common than females. Family history of thin legs and high arches. Hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy are the whole marked feature. A clinical features, weakness in the feet and lower leg muscles, deformities, frequent tripping and falling, loss of muscle bulk in the lower leg, inverted champagne bottle appearance, stork leg appearance. Do you know what's the stork? Stork leg appearance. Stork is a bird. You know the bird? It's a, it's a long legs, very thin, very thin. They Abu Ardan kid of must regulate the wheel or fire. So this is a stork leg appearance, distal muscle wasting, and bony abnormalities, long-standing cases, pis cavus, high arch foot, or foot cavus deformity and derivation of the lumbricle. So what are you going to offer these patients apart from future prevention of further siblings or delivery of another? deformed kid because it's the autosomal dominant so there's a 50 percent chance of having the disease but for those who have already delivered and coming to this life you offer them just orthopedic surgery so correction of their abnormal foot you give them some physiotherapy and, and so forth and education of the watcher right so the signs and symptoms of charcot Mary tooth disease, they vary from patient to patient, but in general they have weakness of the legs and the hands. It usually starts in the feet. The foot is characteristically showing the, the high arch, his cavus, the high arched feet, clothed hand, thin calves due to muscle atrophy, numbness in the feet and or legs, high stippage gait and or foot slapping gait that's why they trip and they fall more often and why they do have this because they have sensory and motor neuropathy so it's the neuropathy part that actually gives him the high stippage gait and the foot drop difficulty lifting the foot the autosomal dominant ataxias are heterogeneous group of disorder with onset after 25 years different genetic loci have been identified the SCA1 to SCA26. This is the spinal cerebellar atrophy or spinal cerebellar ataxia. Very specific disorders described as an autosomal dominant inherited disorders that shows the ataxia have diverse associated neurological features, retinopathy, optic atrophy, extrapyramidal or pyramidal signs, peripheral neuropathy, 
cognitive impairment or epilepsy. So again, why they come in the exam? Because they have combination of upper motor neuron science and lower motor neuron science. They have pyramidal and extra pyramidal. So when you see this combination and they have ataxia and it is not Frederick ataxia, think of spinocerebellar atrophy or spinocerebellar ataxia. I'm very sorry to show you this. Don't feel upset about it. It's basically, uh, we are not going to go through it. Just, I just want you to see that all of them are autosomal dominant. And apparently, every scientist describes one of them. Right? So, you know, they, they discovered another one. They publish it in the literature. Then they say, hey, we got the spinal cerebral at three, number one, number two, number three. And, and they actually did this all the way to scar number 26. And hopefully in the near future we'll have number 27 and 28. I'm not sure really where are they going. But all of them are autosomal dominant. They have some different features, but in general it is a spinal cerebellar ataxia. The classification of acquired cerebellar ataxia. We have ataxia due to toxic reasons. We have ataxia due to immune-mediated reasons. And we have ataxia due to vitamin deficiency or due to other rare causes. So let's take the first one, the toxic reasons. The commonest is alcohol. And alcohol remains to be common. And, and some doctors, particularly cardiologists, are advocating drinking. They say, you know, a little bit of alcohol drinking is good for your heart. Well, if it is good for your heart, it will affect your brain. You know, so what, what is good you have if you have a good heart, but you have, you know, dumb brain or, or a dumb cerebellum, you know. So that's why I really don't advocate alcohol. I don't know. If a patient asks you, should I drink, what do you advise? You tell them, okay, it's okay to have some alcohol. Well, in the West, you know, they advise, they say, you know, one glass of wine per week or, or one glass per day, you know, is good for your heart. But I'm not sure really. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you uh, look at the recent data published uh, from the U.S., uh, they actually reported that almost everyone is drinking. And not only that, but binge drinking is affecting about 35 million American, which is one third of the society. They binge on drinking. Binge means what? They come at the weekend, you know, when they are so stressed and, or, or, or when they face some problem and they just keep drinking until they fall while they're drunk, right? So it's a, a, a relief type of behavior, right? But I don't know, uh, you know, we know that alcohol is very toxic to the cerebellum. If, if they develop a filter that will not affect the cerebellum, then we will start to advocate them to drink. But meanwhile, we have to avoid alcohol because it is not good for the cerebellum. It actually uh, also toxic reasons uh, other than alcohol. We have drugs, either street drugs or drugs that we prescribe as physicians and also substances. And we will mention in detail the drugs and substances because it comes in the exam either in the viva exam oral questioning or in the mcq examination the immune mediated ataxia basically the paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration paraneoplastic means that there is malignancy but it is not a direct structural effect of the tumor it's not like you don't see the tumor affecting the cerebellum So you see what? Right. The cytokines of the tube itself. So it's paraneoplastic. And it's interesting clinically. Why? Because sometimes the paraneoplastic may anticipate the presence of tumor. They don't have malignancy. But they present with a paraneoplastic syndrome before the disease. That means that the, the cancer is very small that is not yet detected small kind of carcinomas, but they, they detect the paraneoplastic disorder. I've seen a patient uh, 
who presented with paraneoplastic syndrome and after two years she developed breast cancer. Other immune mediated ataxia also can present uh, similarly. Then ataxia to, to vitamin deficiency. We mentioned vitamin E deficiency and which type of ataxia is that? To soma recessive or to soma dominant? Well, the, the slide was right there. I'll show it to you. We, we just mentioned that. Here. It's basically a summary system. So that's why I want you to memorize. And you know, the way you memorize it is by letters. So recessive contains lots of E's. There are three E's here. E, E, E. And this is vitamin E, so it has to be a summary recessive. There's no other way that you recall this, you know. In neurology, it, it, it depends on the memory. You have to use the word association to recall things, basically. All right, so we mentioned that the drugs are uh, causing ataxia. So what are the drugs? Phenytoin, phenobarbitone, and lithium. These are very common drugs. In addition to chemotherapeutic agents, we mentioned alcohol, and also infectious agents like acute viral cerebellitis, most infectious agents as well, toxins like toluene, glue, gasoline, or methylmercury. You know, the, the, they sniff glue. This is one of the abused substances. And uh, I, I have seen in Egypt many young street boys and girls are sniffing glue for, for unknown reason. I don't know why. I usually tell them not to do that, but they keep sniffing glue. The subacute forms are basically, again, related to alcohol, nutritional deficiency, vitamin B1 or B12, paraneoplastic, anti-gliadine or anti-GAD antibody. Which disease is that? Celiac disease, correct. You're absolutely right, it's a celiac disease. Or prion diseases, you know, prion diseases, again, may present in subacute fashion. Chronic, like MSA or hypothyroidism or phenytoin toxicity. We mentioned this during the previous lecture, multi-system atrophy. Asymmetrical acquired ataxia, we have the cerebellar infarction or hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, and we have the abscess as an infectious cause of acute asymmetrical acquired ataxia. The subacute, neoplastic, demyelination, and HIV. Now, multiple sclerosis is the commonest presentation of cerebellar ataxia in the exam. And perhaps in real life as well. But in general, if you think of a patient with ataxia, look into their eyes, see if there is optic neuritis, and again examine for features of multiple sclerosis, particularly if they present with the subacute form. HIV-related is commonly seen in countries infested with this uh, virus, and uh, <clears throat> progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is the prototype. The chronic part is basically congenital lesions like Arnold Chari malformation, Dante Walker syndrome, and here the nystagmus is classically upbeating or downbeating. It's downbeating nystagmus, right? Arnold Chari malformation is herniation, almost herniation into the foramen magnum, so it has to be downbeating nystagmus. All right, so this table is a summary of what we discussed so far. And the type of the ataxia may be differentiated by looking at the dysarthria, the nystagmus, the vertigo, the limb ataxia, the stance, the vibratory and position sense, and the ankle reflexes. So let's start with the speech. So in patient with cerebellar ataxia, yes, it's present. We said it's scanning or staccato speech, right? And vestibular, the speech is normal. Sensory, the speech is normal. Nystagmus, present in cerebellum, yes. Present in vestibular, yes. But is not present in sensory. Vertigo may be present. Usually it's not present in cerebellar, but it may be present. Usually it is present in vestibular. It's the hallmark feature in patient with vestibular. They tell you that I actually feel that everything is rotating. It's a vertical. 
and it's not present in sensory. The limb ataxia is present in cerebellar, it's absent in vestibular, and it's sometimes present in the legs in sensory. And, and that's because of, we mentioned the Romberg's test, particularly when their eyes closed. So the, this comes in the stance or standing. They are unable to stand with the feet together, drunken. And the vestibular may be able to stand with their feet together. However, in sensory, where they have the positive rhombring, the rhombic test, they are able to stand with their feet together and their eyes open. Once you shut their eyes, you ask them to close their eyes, they start swaying in form. The vibratory and position sense is abnormal in which disease? In sensory. Because this is the dorsal colon. Vibration and position sense is carried in the dorsal colon and they go up in the dorsal colon until they reach the gracile and the nuclei. Cuneatus and gracilis nuclei. Very good. The anchor reflexes are absent in which disease? Sensory. But they may be pendular and cerebellar, and vestibular, they're normal, they're spared. Localizing cerebellar lesions. So how you're going to say that this is affected and which structure of the cerebellum is affected? Is it the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, or the worms? We can actually have a clue. If it is the folliculonodular lobe, Basically, the eye movement, like nystagmus, ocular reflexes, and posture and gait dysfunction are more evident, pronounced. If it is the worms or the midline, then the trunk and the gait and taxi are involved. However, if the limb is more involved with this artery and hypotonia, then it is the lateral hemisphere. It's very simple. Which tumors that produce ataxia, medulloblastoma, astrocytoma, ebendymoma, hemangioplastoma, metastatic tumor, meningioma, and cerebellopontine angle schwannoma? The CP angle tumor comes very common again in the exam for some reason. Why is that? Because the cerebellopontine angle is the site where there are multiple cranial nerves are present in that area. Which cranial nerve do you recall? We have seen in the beginning of this lecture the fifth cranial natroso trigeminal and also the abducent along with the fascia and the eighth nerve, acoustic nerve. So the CP angle contains multiple nerves and any tumor in that area may present and localize it by the cranial nerves. The treatment, treatment usually we identify the treatable causes of ataxia, particularly the reversible causes. What is the commonest reversible causes in the examination? <laughs> Hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is very common to be corrected. So these patients, they may develop ataxia and it's correct. No proven therapy for scar, the spinocerebellar atrophies. Some patients with paraneoplastic cerebellar syndrome improve following removal of tumor and immunotherapy. Genetic counseling can reduce risk in future generations by asking them not to produce any future generations right all right so that's it that's the end of this horrible information about the cerebellum so what do you think do you recall anything or you forgot everything i said <laughs> it's very difficult but we have to do it this way anyway hopefully by going through the mcqs the information will settle down will settle down. And then I promise you I'll give you a break because I can see that your attention span is over. You know, I know that this is one of the most difficult lectures, the cerebellum, but it's a fascinating structure. It's a very small structure with lots of neurons and lots of computation and it has a lot of differential diagnosis. So we need to know. Unfortunately, there is nothing we can do about the disease except preventing the toxin exposure and maybe treating the irreversible causes. But accurate diagnosis and clinical diagnosis is of paramount importance in helping your patient. So let's start by the MCQs. The first MCQ here 
is a 58-year-old man with a history of multiple sclerosis presents with horizontal diplopia, double vision. Clinically, the diplopia is most apparent while looking to the left. The outer image disappears when the right eye is occluded. On examination, he has weakness of adduction of the right eye and nystagmus on a tenth lateral gaze to either side. Worse on looking to the left. What is the most likely explanation of these clinical signs? So you can see that there is clearly a problem of coordination between the right eye and the left eye. They are not going together, producing two different images, right? And there is nystagmus. Now this is a patient with multiple sclerosis, so there is demyelination. So the way I explain the clinical scenario here is that I would think that the double vision normally should not happen. If the double vision happen, then there is a problem with my focusing. I'm not able to focus, you know, each eye is working alone. They're producing two different images. So what actually makes the eyes produce the same image and focus on the same image? Think of it as binuclear vision, you know, looking into this binucleus, like in the microscope or, or when you're watching a plane or watching, and then you're trying to bring the image to one image, you know. But now you have two images. You have two images from the two eyes. But there is a clue here. Weakness of adduction of the right eye. So the weakness of adduction means the adduction is a function of which nerve? Which nerve supplies the medial rectus? That's the, the trochlear nerve, the fourth nerve, right? So there is failure of abduction. Adduction is failed on which side? On the right side. And there is nystagmus on attempted lateral gaze on either side, worse on looking to the left. What is the question? What is the most likely explanation of these clinical signs? Well, if it is fourth nerve palsy, now remember, fourth nerve palsy is very rare, almost unheard of. You know, there are very few <coughs> syndromes which present isolated fourth nerve palsy, like Toulouse Hunt an infection disease, but in general, very rare you see the fourth nerve, right? So uh, it is not actually a fourth nerve. Why? Because it will not explain the nystagmus. And it will not explain the outer image disappears when the right eye is occluded as well. Perinod syndrome is one of the brainstem syndrome. Sixth nerve palsy is again supplying the lateral rectus, which again may explain, but they said the right eye, is, when included, the outer image disappears. So again, the sixth nerve is not right. Third nerve, there's nothing to suggest third nerve. There's no ptosis, there's no dilatation of the pupils, nothing. So third nerve is out. So what is internuclear ophthalmoplegia? It is due to demyelination of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, that's right, MLF, but I'm asking about the uh, clinical manifestation of intraocular ophthalmoplegia. Now think of it as the coordination between the two eyes. So if you are trying to look at a certain object, the two eyes will focus on the object. And when you move your eyes towards the lateral gaze, one eye has to go laterally, abduct, while the other eye, what does it do? Abduct or abduct? Uh, 
No, if, if it goes to the opposite, then your eyes will, <laughs> will go to either side, you know? No, actually, when one eye abducts, the other eye has to adduct. And, and when this eye abducts, the other eye has to adduct. This is how things go. It's like the car wipers, you know? They go <laughs> with each other. So the eyes does this by the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And, and when this, this structure is actually get diseased or have a lesion in it, or has a lesion, then you develop, or the patient develop internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So there is lack of coordination between the two eyes. It is not so obvious that each eye will go different direction, like this eye will abduct and the other eye will abduct. No, but it will be failure. And the way we know which side is the lesion present, it's the side of the failure of to adduct. So which eye here is failing to adduct? It's... Right. There is weakness of adduction of the right eye. So this is internuclear ophthalmoplegia and the lesion is affecting the right medial uh, the, the medial longitudinal fascicle. So let's read this together. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia INO is caused by a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus which connects the sixth nerve nuclei, this is the abducent, abductor of the eye, supplying the lateral lectus muscle which controls abduction to the contralateral third nerve nuclear supplying the medial lectus which controls adduction. So in unilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, this results in loss of adduction of the ipsilateral medial rectus on attempted conjugate gaze. There is abducting nystagmus of the contralateral eye. This case therefore presents a right side internuclear ophthalmoplegia that laterality of the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia corresponds to the side with failure of adduction. So the failure of adduction basically is the site of the MLF lesion. So the third nerve that is adducting the eye is not connected by the MLF and therefore this is the site of the lesion. It's very common INO for the uh, multiple sclerosis. It comes in the exam very common as well. 45 year old lady has been complaining of unsteady gait, tinnitus and nausea. After investigation, a vestibular schwannoma was diagnosed. What additional sign would you be most likely to find on examination? Dysphagia, loss of corneal sensation, muscle atrophy, ophthalmoplegia, or ptosis. So, ophthalmoplegia. So, why you say that? The, the, let's just identify the problem. This, this lady is a 45 years of age. She's complaining of unsteady gait, tinnitus, and nausea. So, the, this unsteady gait is, 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 is likely to be vestibular attacks because there's tinnitus. We said that if there is tinnitus, then think of the vestibular rather than cerebellum. After investigation, a vestibular schwannoma was diagnosed. Now, think of anatomy now. So, where is this vestibular schwannoma? Very right. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and that's the site of the CP angle. Cerebral pontine angle. So, therefore, ptosis is not trigeminal. It's third nerve. Ophthalmoplegia, there's nothing to suggest ophthalmoplegia here. Muscle atrophy. Dysphagia. Loss of corneal sensation. Which nerve is that? No, this is a sensation. It's not an optic nerve. It's a sense, trigeminal nerve. And you said that this is the vestibular schwannoma related to trigeminal. 
So likely, I would pick this. You know, this this is what makes sense: the loss of corneal sensation. The reason for that are intracranial vestibular schwannomas are extra axial tumors that rise from the Schwann cell sheet and investing either the vestibular or cochlear nerve. As they increase in size, they eventually occupy a large portion of the cerebellopontine angle. So once they mention the cerebellopontine angle, so think of the fifth or sixth or seventh nerve, cranial nerve. Unilateral hearing loss is overwhelmingly the most common symptom present at the time of diagnosis and is generally the symptom that leads to diagnosis. Patient may also have ipsilateral ataxia, facial weakness, and trigeminal sensory loss. Absent corneal sensation is an early sign of trigeminal involvement. So you get that right. Next question. A 25-year-old woman weighing 90 kilograms and 162 centimeter tall presents with visual loss and headaches. So do you think that this weight is appropriate for the height? It's, she's overweight, she's obese. Probably if you calculate the body mass index, it will be in the obesity range. On examination, she has a six nerve palsy and swelling of optic disc. MRI of the brain is normal. So this is a young, fairly young lady, overweight or obese, and she has visual loss and headache. Visual loss and headache. They didn't tell us about the fundus examination. Or they said, no, they said, there is swelling of the optic disc. So there's papilledema. Papilledema, headache, are signs of what? No, I'm talking about uh, the uh, signs of neurology. In neurology explanation, you know, these are signs of exactly increased intracranial pressure. So this is signs of increased intracranial pressure, the papilledema and headache. Now the question here, how this patient have in increased intracranial pressure, but the MRI is normal. There is no space occupying lesion. So what's the most likely diagnosis? This is typical. In fact, not only typical, but it's common. You can see it in your clinical practice. You know, the, the, the first thing to think is dural sinus thrombosis or, or venous sinus thrombosis. But then the MRI will show the abnormality. The MRI will be abnormal. But if you have an increased intracranial pressure and the MRI is normal, then there is only one explanation for that. Normal pressure hydrocephalus will not uh, give you papilledema because the pressure is normal. But papilledema and headache means the pressure is increased, right? So this is not right. Paraneoplastic syndrome, there is nothing to suggest and it will not explain the papilledema. Venous sinus thrombosis is likely. It will explain everything. It will give you increased intracranial pressure. It will give you the headaches. Young female, probably overweight as a risk factor for thrombosis. Uh, and it will be even a hair red hearing if they tell you that she's on oral contraceptive pills as well. So that will make you think of thrombosis. But then the MRI would be abnormal. It will show you the thrombosis. MRI is very sensitive to it. So we are left with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Remember in the past, what's the name of this? They used to call it benign intracranial. We have a big fight back in the 90s. And I remember, you know, the neurologist, I was in a conference and the neurologists were fighting because of the terminology. They said, how come it is benign and it causes a lot of problems to the patients? In fact, if you leave these patients without treatment, they may lose their, their sight because of the papilledema, you know, the optic nerve is this. So it's no longer benign. So they remove the term benign from the terminology and they call it now idiopathic intracranial hyperthesis. It's not idiopathic either. Now the neurologists are fighting. Again, they are saying that there is a cause for it. 
but so far it is still called idiopathic. So the answer is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Diagnosis is previously known as benign intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. This is more common in women, particularly in those who are obese and between the age of 15 and 40. It is important to exclude secondary causes, including drug-induced intracranial hypertension. What are the drugs that causes intracranial hypertension? Nitrofurantoin, oral contraceptives. This is a very common question in the exam, you know, they, they, they ask you about it. And in your clinical life as well, you know, oral contraceptives are common, of course. And tetracyclines, nalidixic acid, corticosteroids, A3, T8, which is basically used for uh, vitamin A derivatives, which is used for acne. And a lot of young girls are developing intracranial hypertension without telling anybody. They're taking the drugs to treat their acne, and they develop this, right? So uh, the third, the, the sixth cranial nerves is a false localizing sign. Why is that? Because it has a long course. So you cannot actually localize based on six when, when it comes to clinical localization or lateralization. Hypothyroidism is incorrect. Some neurological manifestations in sequence of hypocalcemia include papilledema, but would not cause presentation described. All right, the next patient is a 78-year-old man presents with sudden onset of the loss of sensation of pain and temperature over his left face and right side of the body. In addition to these sensory abnormalities, there is left-sided corner syndrome. So let's summarize. Sudden onset, loss of sensation of pain and temperature over the left face. Means which which nerve is that? That's the patient. Trigeminal nerve. That's right. And right side of the body. So left side of the face, but right side of the body. So it is not the same side. It means it's crossed. Crossed. And in addition, sensory abnormality. There's left-sided Horner syndrome. This is classical because, in fact, uh, I have seen it in, in patients with diabetes. And uh, it would be very interesting when you admit such patient in the emergency, from the emergency room and you present it in the morning meeting. So because this is classical because which vessel is most likely involved? Very good. It's a pica. This is pica syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. The uh, left posterior inferior cerebellar artery is the left lateral medullary syndrome, Wallenberg syndrome, which is usually caused by occlusion of the pica. Very common. You've seen one, right? They usually have problems with their gag reflex and they have crossed type of manifestation, you know, fistian nerves on certain side and abnormalities on the other sides of the body. So let's just review the pica, posterior cerebellar hemispheres, as well as the lateral portion of the medulla, which structure vestibular nucleus, inferior cerebellar peduncle, and spinal thalamic tract, spinal nucleus and tract of the trigeminal and nucleus ambiguous. And, and that's the reason, you know, that the cerebellum is on the same side of the spinal. So what we'll have clinically, you will have nystagmus and vomiting, epsilateral limb ataxia, epsilateral because it's the same side. Contralateral loss of pain and temperature, why? Because that's cranial nerves. And epsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation on the face, and epsilateral laryngeal, pharyngeal, and palatal paralysis an epsilateral corner syndrome because of the involvement of the descending sympathetic fiber. You remember Horner syndrome, right? 16-year-old girl presents with a resting tremor in her left arm, 
she is dysarthric and ataxic. And ECG reveals first degree heart block. So heart block, ataxia, she is fairly young and she has dysarthria. What is the diagnosis? Is it Alzheimer's disease, functional illness, Huntington's chorea, neuroacanthosis, acanthocytosis, or Wilson disease? Now, she is 16 years of age, resting tremor, dysarthria, ataxia, first degree AV block. Very little information to make a diagnosis, really. So, it has to be Wilson. Why is that? Because of the resting tremors. You know, if, if they didn't give you this information, then it could be anything else. But Wilson disease is hepatolenticular degeneration. The combination of the cerebellar signs and tremor in a young patient makes Wilson disease most likely diagnosis. So what are the clinical signs of Wilson disease? Just uh, Recall, remember what they, they have in the eye? The Kaiser Fleischer ring, that's right, which is basically due to copper deposition, copper deposition in the iris, and uh, basically how to diagnose Wilson disease? You request copper and alpha seriuloplasmine, and both are low except for the 24-hour urine collection is the investigation of choice. Okay, a patient complaining of diplopia has nystagmus of the right eye on rightward gaze. The left eye fails to adduct. Oh, we mentioned this. We just so this is the most likely location of the lesion. Left frontal eye, left medial longitudinal fasciculus, right cerebellum, right frontal eye, right medial longitudinal fasciculus. So we know that if the eyes are not going together, it's the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Which side is the side of the eye that fails to do what? Adduction. So which one? The left eye fails. So the answer is left medial longitudinal fasciculus. So now you are answering the question. We are making progress. This really makes me happy. You got it really right, isn't it? So do you like that? Okay, so this is left medial longitudinal fasciculus, and we mentioned that it's the failure of abduction. 54-year-old man presents with slowly progressive facial weakness and loss of taste. He has also noticed that he is more sensitive to loud sounds than usual. On examination, there is weakness of the facial muscles on the right, including the forehead, a small patch of altered sensation on the right cheek, and decreased taste sensation. So what is the most likely location of this lesion? Is it cerebellopontine angle, internal auditory canal, parotid gland, petreous temporal bone, or stylomastoid foramen? So again, the clue here is what? Facial weakness, loss of taste, facial muscles, and sensation abnormalities. And so it's trigeminal and facial. So, fifth and seventh, which tells you where? Sir, very good, excellent. Doctor, I got it right. Congratulations. So, it is cerebellopontine angle. And basically, the reason for that is this, the seventh and the fifth nerve. 69-year-old man with known cere cerebrovascular risk factor presents with brainstem stroke as well as ataxia. Dysarthria and bilateral pyramidal tract signs is noted to have impaired upward and downward gaze with preservation of horizontal eye movements as well as the dull's eye reflexes. There is convergence in nystagmus, pupils are dilated and slightly reactive. In function of which part of the brain stem is most likely to have produced his eye signs. So, what are the eye signs? We have impaired upward and downward gaze and those are reflexes. Is it dorsal midbrain, dorsal pons, lateral medulla, ventral midbrain or ventral pons? 
bilateral pyramidal tract summons. Very good. So it's going to be midbrain. All right. So the dorsal midbrain is the correct answer, which is this one. The answer is A because we have D ventral midbrain. And the reason for that is because the vertical eye movements are under bilateral control of the cortex and the upper brain stem. The dorsal midbrain region are associated with failure of vertical gaze. So the clue was the failure of vertical gaze. Very good. 34-year-old alcoholic man has been admitted to the intensive therapy unit after having been found collapsed in B Street. Initial CT brain scan excluded any intracranial lesion. On admission, he had signs of left basal pneumonia, confirmed on chest X-ray and low sodium concentration of 118. You are asked to see him as, although he is now conscious, extubated and able to communicate by blinking. He appears to be unable to move or speak. In examination, he has a quadriparesis of bilateral extensus plantar responses. His eye movements appear normal, as is facial sensation, but he has no gag reflex and is unable to swallow or speak. What diagnosis do you consider most likely when planning how best to investigate this problem? Very classical. Sodium is 118, alcoholic. So is it basal artery dissection, basal artery thrombosis, central pontine myelinosis, guillain barry syndrome, or Miller-Fisher syndrome? Is central pontine myelinosis, CPM, is due to sodium, sodium abnormalities. You know, in nephrology, when the sodium is very low, you have to be careful in correcting the sodium. Rapid correction of sodium produced central pontine, and also very low sodium produced central pontine myelinosis, right? So the CPM is classically occurring in the context of hyponatrin. So the clue was hyponatrin, okay? You want to take this? We'll take a break. All right, I can feel that. So let's just take a break and we'll continue after break. Okay, so let's continue on the MCQ. This patient is a 70-year-old man, arrives at the emergency department an hour after he felt light-headed and collapsed to the ground. He told the two paramedics who accompanied him that he has double vision. Whenever he looks to the right on examination, he's conscious and alert, there's ptosis and a dilated pupil on the left and the left eye is deviated downwards. So this is the third nerve. Right eye movements are normal, as are the right papillary reflexes. The remainder of the cranial nerves appear to be intact. He has a right hemiplegia. Conclusion of which one of the following arteries, uh, occlusion, I'm sorry, occlusion of which one of the following arteries is most likely to be responsible for the above neurological deficit in this patient? Is it anterior cerebral artery? anterior communicating cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, paramedian branches of the basilar artery or vertebral artery. So we know that it is third nerve, it's brain stem, so it has to be posterior circulation, right? So it is not anterior circulation. These are all coming from the carotid, uh, from the anterior circulation. Now this is the posterior circulation, vertebral artery or paramedian branch of basilar artery. So one of them. Which one you choose, D or E? Paramedian branches of the basal artery will explain the story. Because of the, uh, this man presents with left third nerve palsy and contralateral hemiparesis. So it's a crossed 
hemiplegia or hemiparesis, which indicates brain stem. And this is paramedian branch of the basal artery. We'll explain this. Okay, this type of uh, multiple choice questions will not concentrate on the explanation. This is very quick. Just a reminder. A horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus in which the direction of the fast phase reverses with sustained lateral gaze on beats transiently in the opposite direction when the eyes return to the primary position. Terminology. What is the name of this nystagmus? Is it periodic alternating nystagmus, seesaw nystagmus, rebound nystagmus, or disconjugate nystagmus? This is very classical for rebound nystagmus. Rebound nystagmus is basically transiently in the opposite direction. The typical signs of cerebellar herniation include the following. Cerebellar herniation is herniation of the cerebellar tonsils down the foramen magna. And the structure related to this herniation is the medulla. And the medulla contains the respiratory center and the cardiovascular center. So herniation is eminent and difficult situation, right? So basically, the typical signs of cerebellar herniation include the following except stiff neck, alteration of consciousness, ptosis and pupillary abnormalities, cardiac and respiratory and abnormalities. Except, except, so this is correct, consciousness correct, stiff neck correct, ptosis and pupillary abnormality is the third nerve, right? And the third nerve is in the midbrain. It's not in the medulla. So this is medullary problem. So this is the ptosis and pupillary is the except. Romberg's sign is positive in which type of lesion? We mentioned this. Which is carried by posterior column, right? So this is sensory ataxia, very good. Harding's classification of cerebellar ataxia is based upon mode of an inheritance, size of involvement, chromosomal abnormality, or metabolic. Now, this is classical mode of inheritance. Which statement is not true of Frederick's ataxia? Not true, so the wrong answer. Recessive inheritance is correct. This arthria is correct. Flexor plantar response. It's extensor, we mentioned that, so it's extensor, absent ankle just correct. Alcoholic cerebellar degeneration is characterized by gaze evoked nystagmus, limb ataxia, gait ataxia of action myclonus. I think I mentioned this several times. Yes, it's gait ataxia, it's basically drunken gait. We mentioned this several times, thank you. Cerebellar ataxia can result from intoxication with lead, mercury, manganese. This is information. It's mercury, basically. Why this type of spinal degeneration is characterized by limitation of down gaze, limitation of up gaze, slowing of saccadic movement or broken smooth muscles. So it is basically saccadic movement. Combination of epsilateral <coughs> oculomotor palsy and epsilateral cerebellar ataxia is seen which of the brain stem syndrome. Is it Claude, Nothnagel, Weber? or Benedict. It's oculomotor palsy, epsilateral oculomotor, so it's midbrain. We need to know these brain stems. No matter how many times you will read them, you will never remember them. I'm just telling you this so that <laughs> you will not really feel bad. But uh, the, uh, the, we'll try, we'll try, we'll try. We try the brain stem syndromes because they are very difficult and uh, we have to remind each other, you know, like uh, it's very nice if you keep asking you, each other, you know, the third nerve, brain stem, midbrain, the name of the syndrome, so that at least you memorize the case. We'll try to do it together. So basically the brain stem 
is made up of a metric of mixture of long fiber pathways, well-organized nuclei, and network of cells which forms the brainstem reticular formation. Most of the nuclei are related directly either to cranial nerve functions or to motor control pathways. So the cranial nerves are the clue to give us the sight and the syndrome of the brainstem. We have the mid, from down upwards, the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. We have the ascending tracts are the medial lemeniscus, the spinothalamic tract, the spinoreticular tract, spinocerebellar tract, and Q new cerebellar tract. Now this diagram will show you the green are the ascending tracts, while the red are the descending tract. And, and this is a cross section in the brain stem. You can see the posterior root and ganglion, the lateral column, and the anterior root, and you can also see the anterior column and the posterior column. Anteriorly in the medulla, there are the pyramids, right? So the medulla descending tracts are corticospinal pyramids, spinal tract, medial longitudinal fasciculus, tectospinal, and rubrospinal. The location of the lateral corticospinal tracts are basically the medullary pyramids. You recall that 85% of the fibers decussate in the lower part of the medulla. The pyramid decussation is at the level of the anterior border of the medulla. The fibers then enter the lateral columns of the spinal cord. These tracts help with initiating and modulating movements. So this is basically the pyramids. They come from the the, the, the cortex and then they pass through the brain stem reaching the medulla and then that's when they cross over to the other side. So here are the corticospinal tracts, the pyramids. This is the anterior part of the medulla and this is the posterior part. So you can see that this is the structure that we spoke about that coordinates the eye movements, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. We have two, one on each side. And this is the tectospinal tract. The rubrospinal tract is here. And this is the medial lemeniscus. And this is the, the fasciculus cuneatus and the fasciculus gracilis, where the posterior column or the dorsal tract are carried out. Now, this is the cranial nerve. Which cranial nerve is that? That's the fifth. So this is weird. We're talking about what? Midbrain? No, this is the medulla. We're talking about the medulla. So the medulla and, and, and fifth, fifth cranial nerve. We know that the fifth cranial nerve is in the pons. So why we are seeing the nucleus of the fifth cranial nerves in the medulla? No, actually, it, 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 it's very long. The, the fifth cranial nerve, the, the nucleus proper is sitting in the pons, but it extends into the midbrain and extends caudally to the medulla. It's very lengthy nucleus. So the trigeminal nucleus extends throughout the brain stem from the midbrain to the medulla, containing, continuing into the cervical cord. In fact, it actually goes to the spinal cord. So that's why in most of the <laughs> sections we'll find the fifth cranial nerve. It's a big nerve, you know. Trigeminal neuralgia is a very bad disease. And it's common as well. All right, so the ventral part of the brain stem, I will show you the cranial nerves because you need to know the localization of the lesion. So let's start by the first and second. The first and second are outside the brain stem, right? This is the mammillary body and this is the pituitary. So the brain stem starts here at the midbrain. And this is the third and fourth. So the midbrain contains the third and fourth. And then the rules of four applies to the rest of the midbrain. Every four are in, in certain areas. So we have from the fifth to the eighth, they're all in the palms. And from the ninth to the twelfth, they're all 
in the mandala, right? So this is how we recall, we remember, the first two of the cranial nerves are outside the brain stem, they come from the brain proper, and then the third and fourth cranial nerves are from the midbrain, then five, six, seven, and eight from the palms, nine, 10, 11, and 12 from the medulla, right? Now this is the structures, just to remind yourself and remind myself as well, these are the olives, the pyramids are here in the front, and this is the palms, and we mentioned the mammillary body. All right, so now this is the corticospinal tract, the pyramids are still at the level of the medulla. This is the vestibular nucleus, scissory cuneate nucleus, inferior cerebellar peduncle is here, and this is the 10th cranial nerve, so we know that we are in the medulla, but look what we have here, again, the five. So the fifth cranial nerve is present in all the brain stem, and when you see it, don't feel bad about it, it's, it's just long. And this is the nucleus of the 12th uh, cranial nerve, and this is the raphe nuclei present scattered in the middle. The medullary olives, interiorly, we have the inferior olivary nuclei receive input from most motor areas of the brain and spinal cord. Axons project to the contralateral cerebellar hemisphere via the olivocerebellar tract. The medulla sends many fibers to the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle, the spinal cerebellar, olivocerebellar, vestibular cerebellar, and reticular cerebellar tracts. Cerebellum vestibular tract sends information from the cerebellum to the middle. Lateral medullary syndrome, very common. We just have MC, one question about it, right? Yes, it's Pica syndrome, it's Wallenberg syndrome, spinal thalamic tract, spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus, fibers and nuclei of the glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, part of the reticular formation, and portions of the vestibular nuclei and portions of the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Lateral medullary syndrome, again, results in loss of pain and temperature on the contralateral side, spinal salamic tract cross, and loss of pain and temperature on the same side of the face, difficulty swallowing a hoarse, weak voice due to damage of the nucleus ambiguous, loss of gag reflex on the same side and absence of sensation of the same side due to damage to the glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, the same diagram showing the area of the medulla to depict the lateral medullary syndrome. The fibers from the palms are basically the transverse fiber travel through the middle cerebellar peduncle connects pons to the cerebellum. We have seen this middle cere cerebellar plunk is very thick fibers. Longitudinal fibers, these are both sensory and motor, connect spinal cord, upper brain stem, most pass through the pons without synapsing. Two longitudinal tracts synapsed in the pons. The corticopontine tract synapse and pontine nuclei, and the corticocerebellar, or I'm sorry, corticobulbar tracts synapse with the neurons in the trigeminal motor nucleus and the facial nucleus. This is again a cross section and cranial nerve fifth. So this is again likely to represent the cross section in the corticospinal and corticoportine tracts with the spinal thalamic tract and the middle cerebellar peduncle is very clearly shown here with the vestibular nuclei and anterior spinal cerebellar tract. So this is a cross section in the pons. Lesions in the pons, lesion to lateral half of the pons would affect trigeminal nerve resulting in loss of general sensation of the face on the same side. Paralysis to the muscles of mastication with the chin deviating to the side of the lesion and the median the meniscus resulting in loss of position, muscle, and joint sense on the opposite side. Lesion to the lateral half of the pons would affect pontu cerebellar fibers, hypotonia, coarse and tension tremors, tendency to fall to the same side of the lesion. Damage to the mid-pons will develop 
or will result in extensive bilateral lesions involving the pons and the midbrain reticular formation, usually associated with coma. State of sustained unconsciousness and unresponsiveness. Bilateral lesions to the ventral pons caused by occlusion to the basilar artery. Spares the reticular formation, interrupts the corticospinal and some corticobulbar tracts. Results in patient who is quadriplegic, unable to speak or have tongue or facial movements. Brain stem syndrome, locked in syndrome. I don't know if you see this or not, but usually they are in the intensive care units because they are on the ventilator. Bilateral lesions to the ventral pons. Again, patients are conscious. Patient can communicate with eye movements if the corticobulbar fibers to the oculomotor nuclei are intact. Midbrain nuclei, we are talking about third and fourth. The red nucleus, nuclear rubber, involved in unconscious regulation and coordination of motor activities. Superior colloculi, visual reflexes, receive input from the eyes, inferior colloculi, skin, and cerebrum. Fibers project to cranial nerve nuclei and to superior cervical portion of spinal cord, stimulate motor neurons involved in turning eyes and head, involved in visual tracking of moving objects. Again, the midbrain, so we mentioned the superior, the middle and the inferior colloculi, auditory and, and uh, basically olfactory reflexes. This is here a cross section in the midbrain. You can see this is the nucleus 4, the cranial nerve 4. This is the inferior colliculus. And these are the tracts, the spinothalamic tract, there's the mesenchymal nucleus here, the medial meniscus. This is the pontine nucleus, and this is the corticospinal tract that later on in the medulla forms the pyramid. And this is the corticopontine tract, the medial longitudinal fasciculus for controlling the conjugate eye movements is present here. Another cross section showing the same basically tracts. So we have the red nucleus, receives information from the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex. Projects to the cerebellum, spinal cord, and reticular formation. Rubrospinal tract, neurons contribute to upper limb flexion. The periaqueductal gray matter of uh, the midbrain surrounding the cerebral aqueduct involved in pain separation. These are, remember, the aqueduct is going through the upper part of the brain stem. So the area of gray matter is suppressing the pain, coordinates somatic and autonomic reactions to pain, threats, and emotions. This cerebral tragedy, again, is a common, commonly seen in clinical practice and comes also in the examination. So where is the lesion? Transection of the midbrain at the mid collicular level causes decerebration, disconnection of the cerebral control. So at the level above the midbrain, there's no connection with the cerebral cortex. Cerebral peduncles are gone. So basically, these patients are only connected to their brain stem. So they, they present with decerebrate rigidity. Vestibular system drives the rigidity, which is released from control by higher centers. Patient is comatose, and they have classical features. They have upphiotonus, arched back, and they have upper extremity extension, the forearm pronation, and flexed wrist. So this like this. You've seen it, I'm sure. You know, if you go to any IC. Well, cerebral palsy, uh, in general, they don't, they don't because in, they are conscious, right? These patients are comatose. They are very characteristic, this cerebral rigidity. Once you see it, you'll never forget it. And uh, basically, flex stress, lower extremity extension, plantar flexion, 
And now we go to the difficult and really bad topic, which is the brainstem syndromes. You know the brainstem syndromes, right? It's basically crossed, crossed stroke or crossed hemiplegia, but they are very common in the exam. And most of these syndromes are described by neurologists in, in 200 years ago, you know, in the previous two centuries. And we have to memorize them. I don't know why. You know, but anyway, it comes in the exam, so we have to memorize it. So basically, just to remember that the brain stem and cerebellum are in the inferior part connecting the cerebral hemispheres. But the brain stem usually shows cranial nerves on one side and body on the opposite side. So that's why it's called crossed. So what are these syndromes? It's either pontine or lateral medulla or medial medulla. So we have the ventral pons, the base of the pons, lateral medulla, medial medulla, and we have also in the midbrain as well. And the way that we recall them or remind, remember them is by looking at the cranial nerves involvement. But there are fancy names. There's the ventral pontine syndrome. There is Marie Foix syndrome. Looks like French, French scientist. <laughs> they describe this. And medullary syndrome, the Wallenberg syndrome. Dijerine also looks like French, Dijerine syndrome. So these are basically the areas involved in these syndromes. And it's due to occlusion of basilar artery or paramedia perforators here, and the pica in the lateral medullary syndrome, and the vertebral artery perforators in the anterior spinal artery in the Dijerine syndrome. So I just wrote here the, the pictures of the scientists described the syndrome so that you recall them. This is Mortis Benedict, the neurologist who described the Benedict syndrome. And the syndrome affects the midbrain. So as you expect, it will involve which nerve? The third, oculomotor nerve palsy, contralateral involuntary movement, and hemiplegia. Why? Because of the corticospinal tract involvement. And it's due to occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery perforators. This is the first syndrome. The Weber syndrome, again in the midbrain. So the Benedict in this area, the Weber is a little bit ventral to Benedict, right? Similar to Benedict, but more severe contralateral weakness associated with third nerve palsy with dilated pupil can also affect the corticobulbar tract or posterior cerebral artery perforators are the reason, right? So this is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Weber and this is Benedict. Benedict for the third nerve and crossed midbrain. Weber is also crossed midbrain. The difference is this is more extensive and more ventral. The same artery occlusion. It affects the third as well. It's here also associated with third nerve pulse, dilated pupil. Now, Claude syndrome, this is Henry Charles Jules, who described the Claude syndrome. It's more dorsal than Benedict. Red nucleus involvement, so remember that Weber is ventral and cloud is dorsal, but also involves the oculomotor nerve, ipsilateral oculomotor palsy, contralateral hemi, ataxia, and dysmetry. Nothnagel syndrome, this is Sir Nothnagel, superior cerebellar peduncle. Contralateral cerebellar ataxia, epsilateral third nerve paresis can also have bilateral, more often associated with mass occupying lesion of the midbrain. So now four syndromes in the midbrain. Foveal syndrome, foveal is pontine. 
it's actually dorsal on time and means that the basal artery perforators are the reason for the occlusion and facial nerve seventh nerve so we're talking about the palms localizing corticospinal tract epsilateral facial palsy gaze paralysis contralateral hemiparesis Raymond Sistan syndrome Prostral lesion of dorsal pons affects medial meniscus and spinal thalamic tract, cerebellar peduncles, MLF, ventral extension can affect corticospinal tracts. Raymond, again, it comes in the exam, but rarely seen in clinical practice. Miller Gubler syndrome, again, it's a pons. It's more anterior this time. It gives contralateral hemiplegia and epsilateral fascia. So the only difference between molar gibbler and Raymond is that this is anterior. Marie Foin syndrome, lateral pontine lesions, especially brachium pontine, epsilateral cerebellar ataxia, contralateral hemiparesis, contralateral hemihypothesia for pain and temperature. This is the area involved in Marie Foy syndrome. Wallenberg syndrome, we mentioned this again, we will mention it again because it comes in the exam. And in clinical practice as well, it's lateral medullary syndrome, it's a pica, so intracranial vertebral artery or posterior inferior cerebellar artery affects the trigeminal nucleus, spinal thalamic tract, Nucleus ambiguous, descending sympathetic fibers, giving rise to Horner syndrome, epsilateral, vestibular nuclei, inferior cerebellar peduncle. These are the clinical features. Epsilateral facial hypalgesia, contralateral trunk, epsilateral palatal pharyngeal, epsilateral hornal, and vertigo epsilateral cerebellar signs, including hiccups and diplopia. So this is the area described affecting the medulla. So this is the medulla, and you can see the pyramid. So we know that this is medulla from the pyramids. And this part is the part supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And <clears throat> that's the reason for the manifestation is involvement of these structures here, including the descending tract of the Fifth cranial nerve. Tejerine syndrome, medial medullary syndrome. So, uh, Wallenberg or Pica was lateral medullary. If it affects the medial part of the medulla, then this is Tejerine syndrome. That's the only difference. So, in summary, these are the names. And these are the cranial nerves involved. So let, let me just tell you, Weber is third, Claude third also, Benedict third, Nagel third. So the first four are basically oculomotor nerve. Then we have perinode, and this is basically no cranial nerves here but it's still in the midbrain. The palms have four syndromes and the medulla have two syndromes, the lateral and the medial medullary. So let's go to the palms. We have the foveal syndrome, seventh cranial nerve, Raymond, Intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, cerebellar findings, Maillard Gubler, 7th, and Marie Foy, epsilateral cerebellar ataxia. While the Wallenberg, we know it very well by now, it's pica, and the digerine is basically tongue fasciculations. So this is how you recall it. All right, so this is the final part of this today's lecture, the multiple choice questions.
Let's start now. The 70-year-old woman presents after collapsing at home. She has diplopia on right gaze, right-sided facial weakness, and left flaccid hemiparesis. So what do we have here? The most likely site of her lesion. Okay, and why we say that? She has diplopia, right gaze, right-sided facial weakness. So we're talking about seventh. So seventh is pons and for that reason it, it comes very handy right pons very simple very good well done all right 45 year old man presents with sudden onset double vision and right arm weakness examination reveals left-sided ptosis with the left eye deviated downwards and outwards during attempts to look straight ahead which of the following would best describe the presentation Vince Wagner disease, millet Gubler syndrome, Moya Moya disease, Wallenberg syndrome, or Weber syndrome. Why is that? Because we have third nerve palsy, so this is classical of Weber syndrome. 23 year old woman, what is Moya Moya disease? It's again, it's a vascular occlusion and uh, it doesn't actually present to this picture at all, but uh, for some reason it appears in the examination. I haven't seen any patient with it. It initially described from Japan. And because the, the name Moya Moya is Japanese name. Actually. So that's the thing. Anyway, 23-year-old woman complains of double vision on horizontal eye movement examination. She has nystagmus of the left eye and impaired abduction of the right eye when she tries to look to the left. Her other eye movements are normal. What is the likely anatomical equation of the pathology? The pathology is medial longitudinal fasciculus, right? Because there is difference between the two eyes. But we need to know which side. Because the adduction is on the right side, so we mentioned that before. It's actually right. Well done, excellent. I am really happy that you really learned something. So this is, this is very good, excellent. All right, 18 year old girl presented to or at the age of three years with progressive ataxia. She is now wheelchair bound on examination. She's dysarthric with bilateral optic atrophy. There is ataxia and both upper limbs reflexes in the lower limbs are absent with bilateral extensor plantar response. She has absent vibration. Very good, very good, excellent. So basically, echogram revealed left ventricular hypertrophy. This is classical. What's the mode of inheritance? Autosomal recessive, very good. This is classical Frederick ataxia, most common hereditary ataxia. 32-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with sudden onset severe headache and vomiting. She was decorating her ceiling that morning when the headache began. What usually people do when they decorate their ceiling? They extend the neck. So the extension of the neck is the clue here, right? She, uh, she felt mainly at the occiput with neck pain. Some two hours later, she felt nauseated, vomited, and was unable to walk. She takes no regular medication and has no significant past history. Examination is difficult due to severe nausea and vertigo, but does reveal normal limb power on the bed, but an inability to mobilize due to ataxia. She has upbeat nystagmus in all directions of gaze. Her speech is slurred and the uvula is deviated to the right. The tongue appears normal. The left pupil is reduced in diameter when compared to the right. There is reduced pen prick sensation in the left side of the face and in the right arm and leg. Where is the most likely site of her lesion? Is it left cerebellar, left lateral medulla, left lateral pons, right lateral medulla, or right medial medulla? So this is very classical. So this is the left lateral medulla. Remember, when we said that she's looking at the ceiling, we mentioned that she is extending her neck. 
and the, the, the neck extension is basically may affect the artery supplies the medulla and she has classical lateral medullary syndrome it's on the left side so basically the only thing that is giving the clue here is being young so young usually they don't have infarction so the reason for that is because that she is abusing her neck for a long time she developed probably dissection of her artery and that gave rise to left medullary syndrome so this woman has left lateral medullary syndrome which is usually caused by occlusion of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery secondary to vertebral artery dissection so she had dissection of the vertebral artery due to extended neck extension 71 year old man comes to the emergency department with a suspected stroke he has previously suffered from posterior territory TIAs and is already taking clobidogrel. Clobidogrel is an antiplatelet, right? Plavix. The most junior doctor in the team sees, sees the patient first and tells you she suspects a left posterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke. Why she said that? Which of the following findings would you expect on examination? So now you are the consultant, you are the senior. She tells you that this patient probably have left lateral medullary syndrome. And so you zoom into the patient and you show her, you tell her, okay, come here, I'll show you something. So what is the examination that confirms or at least go along with this? A very good. So, excellent. So, epsilateral Horner syndrome. So, and I'm, I'm telling you that you are the consultant. You tell, come here, let me show you the Horner syndrome. Look at the eyes. The eyes are so pin people. They are meiotic. And, and you keep, you know, explaining and tell her about the sympathetic chain and, and how things are. Right? So, the Horner syndrome basically is epsilateral. And this is... We discussed lateral medullary syndrome many times. But you still have problems memorizing it or what? No, no, it's the, uh, either left or right, right. It's still yeah, because uh, it's basically left. She is suspecting left posterior pica. So the, the, the thing to recall is that, you know, if it is in the brain stem, the body is the one that crossed. Uh -huh. The cranial nerves on the same side. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the Horner is ipsilateral. Anything in the face is on the same side of the... Same, same side. Yes. Uh -huh. But the body is contra, contra. contralateral. Okay. 64-year-old mm -hmm. woman presents with sudden right-sided weakness and dysphagia. Dysarthria, diplopia. On examination, she has a right hemiparesis, slurred speech, and normal eye movements with left sixth nerve palsy. She is also noted to have left sided facial weakness. So we have six and seven. She has a history of hypertension, and these are the drugs ramipril, diabetes with metformin, and blood pressure is still high 165 over 90. A recent hemoglobin A1C is 8.2%. So her blood pressure and blood glucose is out of control. Where is the most likely site of her lesion? That's why she developed stroke. So where is the site of the lesion? Is it the right pulse, left pulse, left internal capsule, left hemisphere, or right cerebellum? Very good. So this is basically seventh and the sixth nerve. It's on the left side. So it's the same side, right? So it's left pons. Excellent. So the clinical pattern of contralateral limb weakness with bulbar involvement and ipsilateral six and seven nerve is typical of pontine stroke. The MRI is likely to reveal localized area of ischemia in the left pons. So this is very good. That means that you got some information out of this lecture, which makes me very happy. 45-year-old woman had a right mastectomy two years ago for breast cancer.
She has now presented with a two months history of progressive ataxia and dysarthria. On examination, there is gas evoked nystagmus, dysarthria, upper limb ataxia, and gait ataxia. Power tone reflexes and sensation are normal. Plantar response is flexor bilaterally. CT and MRI brain and CSF analysis are normal. So what is the most likely cause of her ataxia? Very good. We said that, uh, you know, paraneoplastic could actually antedate or postdate the present, but this patient had previous history of breast cancer and now she's presenting with paraneoplastic syndrome. So this is basically paraneoplastic cerebellum syndrome is subacute. Patient presented with acute onset of mild right hemiparesis affecting the body. He also has evidence of sensory loss on the right hand side of his body, but on the left hand side of his face, there is evidence of Horner's syndrome on the left. Which one of the following structure is involved? Is it brain stem, frontal lobe, medial temporal lobe, occipital lobe, or parietal lobe? Yeah, because it's crossed, right? Right hand side of his body, left hand side of his face. Crossed, so it's brain, it has to be brainstem. <laughs> so there's evidence of lateral medallion syndrome. The commonest cause is thromboembolic disease. It comes very common in the exam, this lateral pica syndrome. And that's it for today. We finished. So congratulations. Time. So the next lecture will be nephrology. So we'll start nephrology and uh, we will hope also to present you with a timetable for all the lectures at the end, till the end of the 30 total lectures of part one course. Okay? All right. Thank you very much.